Why the Log Post is Dome-Shaped is such an amazing chapter title. It is like this piece of world building that you think like, oh, okay, it's just like a compass. It's just a like silly little compass. And all of a sudden, a, a hundred chapters after it was introduced, once you think we're no longer really gonna even focus on the compass, we just got like the rug pulled from under us. And it's like, oh, oh, this? No, no, no. We barely just got started. It raises such an amazing question. And the answer is Sky Island. Even Nami the Navigator is like, this must be faulty, right? Like my log post must be broken until Robin just says like, no, trust the equipment. If it says you go up, then you can go up. But I mean, of course, it's, it's not that easy, right? You can't just like levitate upwards. And in the midst of like them trying to figure all of this out, a giant ship crashes down on them which just feels like that extra like oomph that you need to really sell the sky island it's like the ship fell from the sky <laughs> that <laughs> it checks out thing fell from up there must be something up and so like every single bit of the grand line just keeps getting weirder and weirder like, sure, a giant ship comes crashing from the sky and they think, oh, yeah, we're going to go ahead and loot it. And they head down into the ocean depth. And for once, we're able to see, like, the Leviathans fully in their element. I can see this triggering, like, some deep emotional fear of the ocean. I've played enough Mario 64 to know that they're dangerous. Okay? Giant serpent? No. No thanks. In fact, a few seconds later, they get eaten by, like, this big, ginormous turtle. And sure, they managed to survive, but still, you wouldn't want to risk going down there and being just like fully incapable of escaping this giant turtle that is about the size of an island. It is, it is like a, a continent animal. We know of the goldfish from like Little Garden. That's like an island eater. And even now the crew is like, oh, this, this creature is the size of an entire continent. Which, which, you know, it's true. It's huge. It's like, no, no, no. You can fully, if the animal cooperated, you can fully just make a continent animal and live on that island. I can see the, the like, fishmen or the merfish doing something like that. And just seeing the size comparison between the turtle and the little, the little boats just really shows how huge in scale these are. And as it gets, like, darker, these even huger creatures appear, which then, like, shrink that turtle into scale. It's like, oh, if you thought this giant continent animal was huge, check out this, like, enormous humanoid creature that puts the turtle to shame. It also made me realize when, when the ship crashes down into the ocean that salvagers exist. Like, salvagers loot sunken ships. It's a thing that happens in the real world, and it would just make sense. I just didn't think about it. Also from... Uh, Haiku, I want to say their name is Haiku. I don't think so. From Haiku's, like, cover page story, we see that, like, fish people also exist at the bottom of the ocean, and they just live there? There's also, like, I, did I read the cover page right? I think there's, like, an underground, like, slave market of fish people, which is, like, a very dark fantasy element that I wasn't expecting to see in One Piece. <laughs> but, but it's there. Mermaid slavery is a thing in One Piece. In this situation, the people who actually uh, salvaged the sunken ships were these two apes, which I thought they were like devil fruit monkeys. But uh, but nope, a as far as I could tell, they're just normal sentient talking monkeys. And I think they were like very friendly both times. Like we didn't have to, we didn't have to fight them. The apes were just like, hey, we're going to salvage the sunken ship. And instead of just going along with it, they could have been like, oh, our bad. We'll just we'll just climb on up. You know, we're just trying to find out about these sky islands. Do you know anything about that? It, it would have been one of the situations where you didn't have to resort to violence, but you totally did. Those two apes are working for Cricket who goes uh, spelunking for gold. They are a descendant of a very famous person in North Blue, Nolan. The sort of uh, famous story of Nolan has this whole bunch of implications on fairy tales and how this whole world has their own like myths and legends, which always fascinates me because like side note, languages and myths are just completely fascinating to me in fiction. In the world of One Piece, they describe like El Dorado and the Emerald City, which which are stories that exist in our world and also the, the One Piece which is really fascinating to me because it links the One Piece 
to similar mythologies like El Dorado or the Emerald City, just places or concepts or objects that are like so unknown or hidden or just like speculated upon that they almost feel like fairy tales. And while that doesn't imply the existence that they were aware of our El Dorado, it does at least imply the existence of Spanish in that world. And that's weird because you don't really have a situation in One Piece where people speak different languages. There, There is like the cube, which was written in a different language, but that's the only example I got of a different language in One Piece. It's just an interesting side effect of having everyone need to understand everyone else in these stories. The, uh, the sort of fairy tale of Nolan is that Nolan was this adventurer where they went to places that, like, nobody can find. Like the Island of Gold and the, the Sky Island. But all we have is, like, proof of, like, a golden bell and a bird statue. And the logbook that talks about, like, a living sky fish. And I'm like, what? A living sky fish? I've played The Legend of Zelda. I'm, I'm so down with, like, the wind fish. But because Nolan had all of these adventures of weird, obscure places and concepts and locations that were so strange that nobody believed that they're real, Nolan was just deemed a liar. And, and, and I like that whenever anyone mentions that Nolan's a liar, everyone just subtly shifts over and looks at Usopp. And it's talked about like this haha fairy tale, but like Nolan's backstory is pretty sad. Like they went on all of these adventures and yet couldn't document any proof that would allow people to believe them. They like pled and tried to make theories based on their assumptions as to what happened with all the gold on this island. And just nobody believed them and they executed them. Like Nolan, despite trying to make theories and clear up their name, became the most famous laughingstock, the most famous like fairy tale in all of North Blue. Like so much that like Cricket and presumably their other descendants have to live with being laughed at as well whenever like the concept of Nolan is mentioned. So Cricket and the apes live in this government-free zone, kind of like the Caribbean and the Madagascar during our golden age of piracy. Which is a weird thing to say. We had a golden age of piracy in real life. And it's like, yep, Jaya certainly was a pirate island. And oh, that has some baggage. Like our first introduction to Jaya is like one guy beating up someone else in a fight. The second introduction is someone getting burned alive. The third is a, a poisonous murder attempt. And Luffy's like, yeah, this seems like a fun and great place. It's like Jaya is dangerous, as I presume so would other government-free zones during the golden age of piracy. So as this crew enters the bar, they ask about the Sky Island. And you can just feel the embarrassment from like Nami asking about the Sky Island. Because of course, when, when you say it out loud, just nobody's going to believe you. Because if you want to be cold about it, it's like you're going you're gonna to seriously ask about the most famous fairy tale in North Blue. So everyone's just going to laugh. And even if you believe in it, there's this like growing sentiment, at least on this island. I don't know about the rest. There's this like growing sentiment that like dreams are dead and be serious and don't just like hope to accomplish your dreams and all that. So it's kind of like the wrong place to ask. Most people's uh, explanations is that there is a knock-up stream, which is when a part of the ocean just erupts and it launches ships up into the sky and just makes them crash down to earth, which goes ahead and just explains the falling ships. And okay, but with a growing sentiment, this information isn't like, oh yeah, you know, it's the knock-up stream. It's a very insulting to the point where uh, Bellamy starts to fight Luffy and Luffy just has self-restraint and they tell their crew not to fight. And Zoro just accepts it too, doesn't even say anything. They just accept it, which kind of reminds me a little bit of uh, the first chapter where, what's his name? Shanks. <laughs> it's been too long. <laughs> And, you know, it kind of reminds me of the first chapter where Shanks gets in a situation where they're confronted and, uh, like, pushed around, but they don't fight back either. Though, notably, in this situation, it is far more violent. 
Like, notably, Luffy doesn't fight when they're insulted, but rather when uh, stuff like their friend's dreams are being stopped, or when the Going Merry is destroyed, or when people are affected, like Cricket's gold is stolen. In which case, Luffy will fight, and in this situation, just leaves, like, a fist imprint on, on Bellamy. And after Luffy beats up Bellamy and takes Cricket's uh, gold that was stolen, one of Bellamy's crew members asks, like, hey, where do you think you're going? And Luffy replies, the sky. And that is just like an amazing comeback. And it thematically pushes so much against the idea that dreams are dead. And also thematically, people think that Luffy might be lying because their bounty has increased over to a hundred million. And people don't believe it. They're like, this is ridiculous. How could they have over a hundred million bounty? They weren't even in the news. And then your brain just clicks because I remember their bounty going up. And it's like, oh, the fallout of Alabasta. There is a ripple effect going on. Luffy beats up Crocodile. Luffy gets a bounty increase. We can't say a pirate did this, so we gotta hide it somehow. It's like Crocodile's gone. We gotta call in the warlords. We gotta get their replacement. And so we got some warlords that are introduced, including uh, Doflamingo, which I had heard that name before somewhere. But, okay, I didn't know how they looked like, and I thought Bon Clay was Doflamingo when I first saw him. Hear me, but hear me out, all right? It makes sense, I swear. Do, do, like in two? <laughs> and, and flamingo, like, like flamingo. And who has two flamingos? Bon Clay. It's right. It, make, <laughs> it makes sense. Okay, anyways, uh, Crocodile's gone, and it's like, we need a replacement. The five elders of the world government, uh, which is very cryptic, need to find a new sixth member, or else it might disrupt the three great powers. Again, just throwing foreshadowing on there, which I don't know what it's referring to. On the other side, Shanks sends a letter to Whitebeard, and we finally get to see Whitebeard. Honestly, <laughs> we finally get to see Shanks again. It's weird that Whitebeard was literally introduced like the last arc, and now we see him in this arc. Wait, hold on. That's like a hundred chapters ago? Sure, that's a lot, but it's also two islands. So is it really? It's not a lot. This is like one of the things that I couldn't articulate until I started reading One Piece. Like it seems long, but all we really did was move like two islands in the span of a hundred chapters. In East Blue, we just went through like four islands, I think. Like we're, what, 230 chapters in? And we've only been to 12-ish islands, most of which only contain one location. It's, it's actually pretty compact. How'd I get here? What was I talking about? Um... Oh yeah, we got introduced to Whitebeard, which was like the biggest human that I think we've ever seen. Like the biggest human, human. And they get this letter from Shanks <laughs> and Whitebeard just doesn't want to read it. It's like, if you want to talk to me, you got to like give me the whole package, right? Bring some booze, bring some snacks. We'll make a picnic going. So Shanks literally has to get up and set sail to go talk to him. Cut to the world government wanting a replacement they're they're like panicking they're like who should be our replacement and while they're having this conversation trying to debate who should be next someone enters the room and they're like oh i think i know someone and i know they're about to do something big and just cut to blackbeard amazing segue blackbeard was uh, thought of at least around little garden teased around drum island hyped up in alabasta and now officially we've seen him in jaya we see blackbeard and luffy have uh, similar likes and dislikes like in food but also similarities like their concept of dreams and oh forget about those guys and like forget about the small fish when you're aiming for the top and so right we had cut to blackbeard and you're looking at the crew and then, wait a minute, it's like, wait a minute, we, we've seen them before, sprinkled all throughout the opening of Jaya. It, it's beautiful. It really does feel like everything is compressed and interconnected. Also, in this arc in particular, it feels like Usopp is, is the most human character. Like, Usopp was uh, afraid of going on the Sky Island, and they lashed out. And, you know, they started to doubt themselves. They're like, am I a coward? And Ami's just like, yeah, you are a coward. But Usopp here is, is the most human. They're cowardly, sure, but they're ultimately just afraid to die. 
Like conceptually, even if you believe the story of Skypea, you need to know where to navigate to. In this situation, we're using echolocation, which is out of the box. We got like monkey sonar, <laughs> which can like detect the ocean floor and like stuff nearby, even with inconsistent weather patterns. And we're also using a bird who always looks south for navigational purposes, using the animal sense of direction. And if you're really aware, you can use animals in general just to know where you are, like the sea cat in Alabasta or Laboon that was from North blue i think no yes no i would get so lost in the ocean so if you believe the story of skypea you need to know where to navigate to you have to hope you find a stream you have to make sure that your boat is in a good condition the go and mary was absolutely destroyed that poor poor boat i i love how uh we can see that it's being withered and damaged we can see like the poor uh, repair job and the even better repair job from the monkeys because as luffy says it feels like the going mary is part of the crew i feel like on the crewmate to-do list you need like a boat repair man but it gets fixed and the going mary gets like dripped out it's got like wings and a little outfit so you need to know where to navigate to, you need to find a stream, you need to make sure your boat's in a good condition, and then you have to launch yourself and hope that you're aligned with a cloud. And all of this is if you believe that the story of Skypea is a fact, because if you don't, then it's a gamble. Then you're just like launching yourself into the air and you're not 100% certain. And if it's just a cloud up there, you're going to come crashing down. And that is it. And so as they're sailing to the knockup stream, it becomes a now or never situation where Luffy is even more excited than ever to fly. Meanwhile, like half the crew is starting to have second doubts. They're like, hey, we can still back out of it. We, we just have to leave the knockout stream. And Luffy is just fully committed. They're fully into it. And the knockup stream just creates a giant beam up to the sky. And we see like full on leviathans falling out of the sky. We see other ship pieces. And it is just one of those like visual scenes that makes me want to tear up because of how amazing the spectacle is. We see them hosting the sail and trying to catch the wind upstream, transition into seeing a flying boat. Just everything works here for me. The concept is like extraordinary and I wouldn't even have thought about it happening. As I've mentioned, it's compressed and interconnected, and it calls back to a lot of previously established elements. It truly makes me excited for the next arc, which is Skypea. Oh, man. Uh, too bad that, um, spoiler, there's nothing up there, and they just fall back down and they die, and that's how One Piece ends. <laughs> we see Shanks' adventure now for the other 600 chapters. Luffy and the crew are just dead. 